Welcome to The Conversion Show. Today, I'm really proud to have my guest, Drew Sanaki, who we go back 10 plus years. And I encourage anyone listening, if you're in front of a computer, type in Drew Sanaki into LinkedIn, and you're going to find a background that is is very, well, what's the word? Diverse, Long. healthy. Lo um, and Long and boring. <laughs> it's well-versed. Karma Loop, uh, retailer. He's been a retailer himself. He is now CEO of uh, Postpilot, a direct to consumer um, postcards, highly segmented, which is what we're going to get into today. Very exciting. So, Let's welcome roll. to the show, Drew. Thanks, Eric. It's good to see you again. As you said, we've known each other for 10 plus years. I remember when we took over Karma Loop, you know, we got it out of bankruptcy. And one of the first things we did was put uh, Just Uno up. And that was probably 2014, 2015, just to re-engineer the pop-up. And they they were amazed at how we went from, I don't know, we probably 10x to the opt-ins uh, in a week back then. Drew's always been a big supporter. It's very exciting. And you, uh, you turned that thing back around to 100 million, didn't you? Uh, it was more, you know, we got it cash flowing again. And I think at its peak, it was up around a hundred million, but you know, for us, the big, the big win was just to write the ship and then sell it to a, uh, a strategic, which we did. So huge background in retail background in turning companies around drew for years. I was so always so impressed with, um, he has this 30, 60, 90 day, um, what do you call it? Can you, can you share with the crowd your 30, 60, 90? Cause this has always been. That came from private equity. I think it was like, yeah. whenever you buy a company or acquire a company, you, uh, the investors all, the board wants the 30, 60, 90 plan. And it's like, yeah, you might have a five-year plan for how you're going to grow this thing, but you have to show the team that gave you the the capital how you're going to make significant changes in the first 30, 60, 90 days. So everything sort of came from that. I mean, at Karma Loop, at Auto Anything, um, we had these sort of well thought out strategic plans, but what the board really wanted and what, what I have since learned, they pitch their investors on, or they have to update their investors on is like, what, what, have you, what are you going to do in the first 30 days? You know, how do you hit the ground running? How do you get this thing cash flowing quickly. It's the low hanging fruit. Yeah. It's always, it forces you to focus on the low hanging fruit. And in today's market, there is still so much low hanging fruit. And, you know, Drew had that years ago. It was, if I recall, it was the email. So, you know, sending a 30, 60, 90 day email to those segments and you're early on in, you know, segmenting your, your audience, your own channels with email. And I, what we're going to talk about today is where are we, you know, today? And with when we talk about customer lifetime value and we talk about other low hanging fruit, Drew has uncovered a great one with Postpilot. And can you share, you know, how how you, you know, the new way to do postcards and kind of your approach? Yeah, it's just I Postpilot started with so we do direct mail for e commerce businesses. Our goal is to help more businesses unlock this channel to become more resilient businesses, right? To diversify their marketing, to do everything from retention to acquisition through direct mail. Um, I got the idea because I've always used it. So I've been in e-commerce for 20 years. And as you mentioned, in turnarounds, we'd acquire a property or, or we'd take over a property and uh, very quickly have to look for what's the low hanging fruit. A lot of that was on retention. The brands weren't doing retention well enough. They weren't re-engaging past buyers. And um, when you looked at the data, most of those past buyers, which is a very rich audience for any marketer, were not subscribed to email. So they had either never subscribed or who had, had unsubscribed. So there's really only one way to get a hold of them. It's direct mail. It's the only way you can get all your customers because the customers don't have to opt in. It was always very hard. At Karma Loop, at Auto Anything, you know, you'd have to find a printer. You'd have to 
uh, upload your designs. Attribution was a mess. You know, it was a long lead time from when you decide to run the campaign to when you see the results. And I said, like, why can't it be as easy as easy as email? You know, I want it to be like Clavio or 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 SendLane or OmniSend, where you just log in and send. Um, so I I built Postpilot to do that. I actually acquired it off the developer probably in 2018, and we spent about a year on the product, turning it into something like Clavio for postcards on the retention side. Uh, since then, the platform's evolved, so we've added in remarketing, retargeting. And, uh, and now acquisition, you can do things like catalogs, you can do things like shared mailers to get the cost down, um, but it's all within the platform. And I think we timed it really well because in, in 2020, 2021, Apple comes out with iOS 14, which makes Facebook really hard for a lot of brands. So I think the last 10 years made us lazy, lazy marketers where you'd throw money at, at Meta and it would work. And all of a sudden it didn't in 2021. Um, so brands started realizing that they had to be marketers again, that they needed to diversify their, their revenue channels. And, uh, we were there in the Shopify app store as, as the, as the leading direct mail app. So it's just been a bit of a, a rocket ship since then. That's fun. The, uh, retention has been a major word with, with the customer acquisition costs, Facebook, everything. And so we actually, you know, we have been hearing about mailers becoming more popular again. What's new with, with postcards or catalogs, you know, as you go to post pilot, see so you're doing segmentation, personalized um, mailers. What's, what's present? What's the new, what's hot? What's new, I think is segmentation. Really, it is it and automation. Um, maybe 10, 20 years ago, direct mail was, you know, you you upload a CSV to a printer and you send the same offer to everybody on that CSV. Well, now you can much much like email, you can segment your customers based on what they purchased before. You know, recency, frequency, and monetary spend, which is kind of how the catalog industry has always done it. But how recently somebody's purchased, the number of times they've purchased, the total amount they've spent. And you can just automate these campaigns such that as customers or people fall into the various segments, the system will print and send a card, even if it's like one, one card a, a week, right? So you could have your abandoned cart campaign cloned into a postcard. You could have uh, a handwritten note go out to VIP customers every time they reach a, a dollar threshold. You know, the total spend goes to a thousand. I want them to get the handwritten note. And then you can have your retention campaigns go to customers that haven't been around in a while that you want to pull back to buy again. So I think as a marketer, just the possibilities are endless. It's all It's all within the app. You just want to be able to segment and target. I think stepping back a little bit, you always want that sort of holy grail of the of the right offer to be in front of the right customer at the right time. And okay. it can be on, it should, you know, no. it should be on site. And this and, wasn't a lead into Justino, but it should well, be on you know, site. You, if someone wasn't paying attention, they you would think they were you were talking, explaining the on-site experience of how it should be. Yeah, but it's like it's sort of like if I'm in a certain segment, if I am somebody who bought once and hasn't been around for 60 days and I'm due to buy again, you want to give me an offer. You know, it might be a discount. It might be like, hey, you might also like this to purchase. I should get that same offer when I open my email, when I look at my SMS, when I check the mailbox or when I go on the site. You know, it should just be consistent. You know, everything you just talked about, you know, you know, recency, frequency, monetization, you know, I laughed when you said, you know, the right offer at the right time to the right customer. Literally, my team, we wrote that down last week, you know, because people want, they expect it to speak to them. And it's, it's really refreshing to hear you talking about so, mailers the same way we're talking about the on-site experience here at Justuno. And it goes into old school retailing. 
Yeah, it goes back to really, I mean, I learned it from Seth Godin, who wrote Permission Marketing. I don't know what, the, 25 years ago or something, but he just talks about the best marketing is personal and relevant. And, and if you increase that relevance, like what's going to increase the relevance? It's a personal offer that's like, that's designed with you in mind. So as we talk about the personal offer and, and it being relevant, we we're talking about zero and first party data. How are you as a company working with digital marketers, e-commerce managers to get that data uh, into your system? Well, on the retention side, I would say most of the brands have that data. You know, you've got the customer, you know what he or she bought before and when, you know, and your transactional data, uh, you know his or her address, right? So it, it becomes very easy there to segment off of that stuff. You know, customer bought this, they might also like this. Customer hasn't been around in a while, let's send her this other offer. And so being in Shopify, that's you're obviously just connecting the app and you're able to access that data. And then you sure. Your if you're on Shopify, up. we could we have a native integration. If you're on Clavio, we have an integration there. You know, you can pull that data from a number of different sources. Um, so I think of direct mail is very similar to email on the retention side. It's different from email on retargeting and on acquisition, where it's more akin to Facebook, because there you can look at your existing data, generate a lookalike audience, so a brand new cold audience, layer on top of it, direct mail attributes, household spend has bought from a Walmart before. And then you can get very targeted with your prospecting campaigns or your retargeting campaigns. Hey, attribution has been a big subject of conversation and debate this year, especially with SMS marketing. What, how do you approach attribution with mailers? Is it unique promotions, unique URLs? How do, how do you communicate that back, the ROI and value back to your clients? Yeah, this is something from, you know, you ask any CMO. If you if you add up all the attributed revenue, this is typical like at Carmel. If you add up all the attributed attributed revenue from, e you know, email, Facebook, Google, whatever, and it's like three hundred percent of the actual yeah. revenue of the business. It's like you look at all you go on LinkedIn, you see all these different posts like we increased you know case studies, we increased their ROI. Yeah, so everybody by one hundred and thirty percent, and there's like ten of them. <laughs> Obviously, every service <laughs> provider out there is going to try to lay claim to as much revenue yeah. as they can. And post pilot's no different, you know, we're, but I would say it's realistically a, as a CMO or CEO, th there's an upper and lower bound, you know, in direct mail, you see the list that received, you see the, the group that received your, your marketing campaign, and then you see what they did on the site afterwards. So you can calculate a lift or on the, on, I would say on the, on the more conservative side, you can measure things like coupon redemption. Control groups. So control can, groups, another, you know, that's probably the gold standard is like, okay, if you, if you know, you're somewhere between the customer ROAS and the, and the coupon ROAS, like a, a holdout group will yeah. tell you exactly the impact of any promotion. We were talking about control groups last year, last week in terms of even looking at pricing different, like <laughs> how to structure like, how do you show value of your own SaaS company to your clients? It's a whole nother subject, but it's important for digital marketers to be able to report back to their team, their bosses, you know, or report to their CMO. Hey, look, here's some attributable revenue for real and <laughs> because we did a control group. <laughs> right. And I think really every service provider probably could do control groups, but they, they don't for, because the results won't be as strong as the. Yeah. And they're the ROIs actions. that they claim to produce. Um, different subject, different subject. Can we, can I challenge you on something? Yeah. Go being for a, it. Having studied environmental design and trying and being a homeowner now and going to my mailbox and getting all the mailers. I'm going to give you benefit of the doubt here because not only because I see you do some sustainable work with planting trees and using good paper. Um, I'm all about getting less paper used. 
Now, if you can tell me we send less because they're more and they're more effective because they're highly segmented, you've you I I'll help build your case. <laughs> Okay, that's interesting. Um, it's the first time I've heard. I mean, we from the get go, we realize like direct mail produces paper, uses paper, right? It's, and we've had some customers who are sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. You know, we try to offset it as much as we can, um, but it's it's the nature of the category. I think that that you print it on on paper. But to your point, you know, if you did a highly targeted mailing of our catalog alternative it's called a catalog versus a, a 90 page catalog or whatever a large you're going to save paper so yeah you'll if you're already using direct mail and using a a catalog we could save you paper you print on rice paper <laughs> i don't know i don't think so <laughs> well you you, you hear people I, I, there, there are some alternatives like hemp paper rice paper yes yeah and we are, we have explored some of those well, you know, with consumer goods, people, you know, people talk about how they you know, consumer responsibility, people do do shop based off of, um, you know, environmental consciousness or or, you know, shopping gives is another example. People want to, you know, shop with brands that support causes, whatever. Um, I'm just curious you know, your approach, your company's approach to that. So it sounds like, you know, not doing the big catalogs, it's very, sh as minimal as possible. Yeah. Recyclable paper, um, offset the print, offset the, uh, the print jobs we do have. And, um, you know, I would say like by nature in our industry of e there there's a lot of, there are a lot of trees being cut down you know not just for the direct mail portion but the the cardboard right for packaging. the shipping and the packaging, packaging. right um okay fair enough speaking of postcards and designs you know as i'm going through it the designs themselves and the personalization how what what is effective these days yeah, it looking it looks like they're very they're almost look like pop up designs. The ones I'm seeing on your site. How do you approach the actual effectiveness and and cards that are going out? Has anything changed? Are you experimenting with anything unique? Yeah, I mean you can a b certainly a b test creative, and a lot of our customers do that. Um, but I would say think of it. You know, it's a visual medium, so we we tell our customers like, hey, think of it as a Facebook ad, right? You need a strong call to action a good offer. Um, it's probably not the place where you just want to do some um, some thought experiments or sort of like uh, a card with just branding where you can't even understand who sent it, you know? Uh, that's Leave that for more like on-site stuff. But I would say, yeah, show the product, uh, strong call to action. Coupon code really helps assess uh, attribution and encourage you know, encourages the recipient to act, to act. So I'm on your Academy. Um, and going through here and, you know, at, digital marketers are trying to learn, you know, if they're going to invest resources and time, which no one has, um, they're going to look for something that has automation. You know, I just need to need to turn this campaign on. Um, Let's talk about that automation component because we're doing a lot of work with that too. And digital marketers that are too busy. What, what's the number one thing that when you work with new clients, do they have aha moments of like, oh, why didn't, you know, why didn't we do this months ago, years ago? Or are they coming from a different direct mail background? If what's they're coming from direct mail, I think they're sort of there's some, they're shell shocked a little bit because that industry is very old school. They're used to a direct mail agency saying, okay, now we've got to requisition the paper and then we're going to find a printer for you. You know, and it's just paralyzing. You get these invoices that are a mile long with all the little, like here's for the pr postage and for the paper and for the printing. So I think the first eye opening moment is when they realize it's one cost for everything included. 
right? That the per card cost means like for the print, the postage, the scent, like the whole package, which if you're coming from digital marketing, you're thinking like, of course it's, you know, that's what I'm used to. I'm used to SaaS. But if you're coming from direct mail, that in alone in and of itself is different. Um, and the other thing is like, we, we do it all. Like we adopted this, we essentially have a direct mail agency inside the business that does like campaign setup, deployment. Um, we can get you set up with a strategy and execute on that strategy often in like seven days. So you sign up today. In seven days, you could have everything ready to go to your customers. Um, we've really tried to take all the thinking out of it and do all the work because because CMOs are busy. Like they, they don't want to have to figure out a new channel. So we'll help them do it. To me, I, I know very little about this market. And so it's really interesting to hear. I remember when we were doing the, the Sears Snowboard, I was so amazed and shocked that the post office has an, their own sales team and marketing team to like help businesses get into direct marketing mail because it supports the, uh, the post office. Um, yeah, like the average amount of mail carried by a mail courier has been going down for something like 15 years. So that team at the post office, like th the more they can drive to direct mail, the better for them. So getting back to segmentation, that's what really got us into this, this conversation is building audiences and segments. Is Does a 30, 60, 90 still apply to the, the direct mail world? Or how are you? Yeah. So when you say 30, 60, 90, you mean for the customers? Yeah. Yeah. So that's just a rule of thumb. And, and what you're talking about there is like, you look at like repeat we call it intra-purchase latency, which is like the time between purchase. And it's different for every business. You know, if you buy a, a BMW, it's 10 years, you know, if you buy toilet paper, it might be 30 days. I would say for uh, on average for e-commerce in apparel, you know, I like looking at that sort of 30 day mark as when most customers typically come back and buy again. Um, and the general theory is that, or what the data suggests is if you are selling a consumable, if you're selling a product where the customer comes back after 30 days, if, if they are going to rebuy, they've come back within 30 days. That tells me as a marketer, for, ev for the time between now and that 30 day mark, my customer is still likely to come back. So what do I want to do? I want to show her more things to buy at full margin, right? It's only after that 30 days does that customer become less and less likely to ever come back. And so that's probably when I get, want to start discounting and promoting more to try to bring her back because she's not she's gone at the 60 day mark at the 90 day mark if she still hasn't come back she's gone. So what those, you know, I call them rungs on a ladder. You want to build out a discount ladder. Um as the customer gets farther and farther away from his or her most recent purchase you can, as a marketer, give away more margin to try to bring her back because you're syncing up the promotion with the cus customer's propensity to buy, right? So it's different for every business. You know, one thing we built into the app, if you add the, the Postpilot app uh, to your Shopify stores, you'll get that report that shows you what your specific customers look like. Oh, tell me about that. I, by the way, your discount ladder, I remember that. That totally brought back memories. <laughs> brought back, was that, it fond memories? Uh, no, but it just, you know, if anyone lis is listening right now, what Drew's really, he's talking about is just understanding your customers. Oh, yeah. And Let me, that, um, can I screen share on this podcast? Yeah. If anyone uh, watching on YouTube, we will do a screen share. You can see us and we'll, we can drop a link in the, um, I'll drop a link to the video in the, Okay. Okay. So what I'm showing you um, is one of the reports you get when you add the app Postpilot to your Shopify. It's the time between purchase re purchases report or intra purchase lat latency report. And for this brand, it's it's bucketing your customers in um, in these these recency buckets. So. The first one is zero to 29 days. This is like the first 30 days after purchase, 
you've got 44% of your customers have come back to buy again. By day 60, after their first purchase, you're up to 64%. By day 90, you're up to 77%. Does that make sense? These are cumulative percent of repeat orders. Yes. Um, between the first and second order. Okay. So the question, you when, you when you go to do retention as a marketer, uh, you're going to say like, what do my typical customers do? If they're going to reorder, 77% for this brand have come back and reordered by day 90 in the first three months. So what that tells me as a marketer is, okay, up until day 90, my customer is still likely to come back and buy again. I want to show her more things to buy at full margin, right? I don't want to give away promotional dollars before day 90 because she's going to come back and buy. It's only after day 90 that that customer becomes less and less likely to ever buy from my brand. That's when I can afford to give away margin in the form of promotions to bring her back. So we use this data to set up retention campaigns and post pilot. You know, you might start with a post-purchase campaign up here at day 30 or day 60. That just shows more things to buy. If they bought the bed, I want to I want to sell the bedding. You know, if they if they bought this supplement, I want to I want to sell more of that supplement. It's only after day 90 that I want to start my discount letter. I want to start giving away 10%, 20%, 30% as time goes on to bring that customer back. My my mind is just teeming with, you know mirroring your offsite experience with your on-site experience. You mentioned like, you know, product recommendation. That's a powerful engine that you, how great it would be if you could take, you know, that same rec product rec drawer that's on the site, take it and put it on. Oh yeah. We're no, definitely I mean, going to have to talk integrations deeper. Yeah. That's when it gets really cool. Yeah. You know, that's and it's fun. like how long until AI does all this stuff for you across Seriously. every channel. I don't know, but we were at Google next last week. It was kind of interesting. Um, that's yeah. The next couple of years should be, I, I thought it was very, you know, everyone's using it as a buzzword and saying they do it, but practical app, applications, applications, <laughs> uh, and the consumer goods will be coming out. A lot of it's kind of behind the scenes automation yep. that's, that's going on right now, but it is, there were, there were very few consumer products there. Um, that's going to be exciting. So, you know, as we, as we look at time here, you know, and it's the reinforcement of talking about your customer, who they are, where they are, and what they want to see. Are you, you know, as Clavio is doing a big push to try to become the central hub of customer data, that's been their big push. And you had like, you know, Dacity and different data hubs like that. Shopify has great access to their data. Google's relaunching their analytics. Are you, where do you look? Are you looking at any of those platforms? You mentioned you integrate with Clavio to really kind of understand the customers. What, do you have any tools that you, you recommend to clients? I mean, you could, do, we, we see a lot of our brands um, like doing their CRM segmentation work and stuff in Clavio or in Shopify. And so we built the app to sort of be native to both, you know, in other words, if you, if you want to run your CMM, CRM through Clavio, you can do that and just drag postcards in as a, as a trigger, as part of a flow. Um, you know, we're, tr we're not trying to be that CRM despite yeah. the reporting, I think, um, because I think there's plenty, and that's a very crowded space and there are a lot of big players. I think we just want to work as a, as a trigger that kind of talks to whatever you are using as your CRM. I can't wait to see your dashboard more because I mean, it's all about being best of breed in your niche and, and educating them. I, I that's the first time I've seen the whole, that your discount ladder actually visually represented in a dashboard. So that's super exciting. It's a great, I mean, I've been, I love that report. I've always used it. Surprised that more apps don't build it in. You know, I haven't worked with Triple Whale much um, or Lifetimely. Those are others that that I think might do it, but I don't have enough experience with either app. Well, I think where we are today in you know, talking about zero party data and um, 
it's one of those things where, great, we have all this data and there's all this out there, but it gets back to the low hanging fruit and your original 30, 60, 90 that private equity looks like. Like, how do you make an impact to your business today? And you don't need tons of data. You just need the right tools and the right strategies. And I'm going to say you're changing my viewpoint on how to approach direct mail. I'm gonna well, I would step back and I would just, I would look at what we've done when we've bought companies and where the, it's all about the 80, 20 and the low hanging fruit, you know, Carmeloop had an email list of like 5 million and they sent the same offer to everybody every day, you know? So just by segmenting and, and targeting your customers a little bit better. And I would start with retention with just a simple post-purchase win back, you know, or, or second purchase campaign gets you another 10, 20% on, on, on really the top and bottom line. So like with all these brands, that to me is the 80, 20 is like, get your retention squared away first before you start trying to overhaul your acquisition pro, you know, it, program because it's expensive there. I often say it's the, you have this nucleus of your current customer base and like grow it, you know, expand it out slowly from your core customer base instead of like, you know, try, thinking you can just build this gigantic base all of a sudden, invest in that core, understand the customer, and then grow till it grows more sustainably. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the more you get your, your sort of flywheel cranking, you know, then I, I, another thing I talk about a lot is there are like three multipliers, right? There's three ways to grow revenue for any retail business. It's acquire new customers. It's keep them buying longer, right? And then it's AOV, increasing the the average uh, basket size. Yeah. And everybody goes right to acquiring more customers, but the problem there is it's like the most expensive thing out of all those. If you focus instead on optimizing your your basket size, your your cross sells and your upsells, and then on the retention side with getting people to buy more often and buy more, you know, more frequently. Uh, when you do go and and focus on acquisition, you're gonna you're gonna get a better ROI than you would before because you've already optimized the engine. Sounds like you're talking about conversion optimization. Yeah, that's part of it. You know, <laughs> even within I would I would put that under acquisition because really like you fix conversion rate optimization, you're gonna acquire more customers and it's a hell of a lot cheaper than going in uh working on your acquisition funnels. So the last few minutes we have here, because as you can hear Drew talk about retail, his depth of understanding, are there any other outside of Post Pilot, you know, anything you're seeing that you're like, oh, that's cool or exciting you seeing what's happening in the market presently? Um, you know, I just see, we we have a lot of, CPG brands, I would say. We've got 8,000 brands on the platform, but CPG is is a big segment. And most of them have, you know, it's, it's I hate to say omni-channel because it's a over overused, but just like taking this omni-channel approach, like they're using their Shopify data to generate lookalikes and drive people to purchase at a Whole Foods, right? So they've, they've realized that you've got access to first party data through your website and it doesn't have to live in a silo like you can use it to drive people to your wholesale partners right and people are using direct mail to do that through through postpilot we call it a shop drop but that's like exciting it's just it's interesting to just see how everybody used to think like we're just going to go it alone as a d2c brand but it you know I think there's been this realization over the last few years that D2C is just a sales channel, right? And we've got to optimize the entire business, not just not just uh, go it alone as a D2C brand. Well, what I like about that, that really goes back to traditional retail where brands used to design the product and market the product and they left retailing to all the retailers. And they their, their marketing was to drive consumers to the stores to buy. And so it, it really is reinforcing kind of going full loop to old school days of like, you know, 
part of the DTC was like, we can own the whole thing and have higher margins. But now it sounds like the shift is more of, no, 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 we understand we can't do this alone. Let's, let's see if we can't leverage our distribution network further. Yeah, the I, I see a lot of brands that are killing it. And in particular, there's that category of like these old school manufacturers that would produce a, an, an interesting proprietary product and they never had co- you know, contact with the customer. They always sold it through you know, Amazon or Walmart or something. And then they realize now that they can set up their own Shop- Shopify store and go direct with it and get much better margins. Now it requires, is it, there's like a cultural challenge there because they've built an entire business around one channel. And in many ways, it's a threat to that channel. But the the brands that are able to overcome that do really well online. Now they're, it's been interesting, you know, a lot of DTCs go into brick and mortar now, you know, like Rad Power, you know, Rad Power Bikes being one, like you see these, you know, they're, they're now having to learn brick and mortar that, you know, whereas the other brick mortar are having the learning curve of, curve of learning online retail, which is completely right. different, different skill set. Um, that's that, that could be, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> but I, I, I know you have to get going as, as well, but you know, for anyone listening, um, you can you can go to Postpilot and and hop in and get a uh, kicking the tires free account right now. Um, yeah, shoot us an email. You know that's probably the best way. Um, Drew at postpilot.com. There it is, and, and we'll hook you email. up. I I didn't even plan on going so deep into Postpilot because Drew and I have so much background we can talk about, but I'm actually really excited to see what you're doing here. I think it's great. It's I love it. You know, having run brands and now it's a software company, right? I still th- I call it that, even though we have printers. Yeah. Um, it's it's really different and fun, and I get to see a lot of different brands and kind of what's working. So that, so I've enjoyed that that part of it, and really like running a business is running a business, you know, and it's it's kind of fun, whether it's D 2 C or software. Well, if Drew's behind it, you're in good hands. So uh, with that. That's all I'm going to leave it at. You can go Thanks, man. <laughs> well, this was a lot of fun. You know, yeah. I got to come up to the Bay Area. We should grab a beer sometime. Over here. All right, Drew. Well, we'll sign off for today. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, let's thank our guest, Drew. Thanks, Eric. All right. Take care. 